All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it's amazing to see so many people out in the morning. And hello to you back there who waved to me. Thank you. Um, so I'm Ellie Powers. Um, I'm the product manager for Google Play Developers. So many of you guys here. Hi, I'm Miles Barr. I'm the engineering manager for apps in Google Play. Hello, I'm Ricardo, tech lead for the Google Play Developer Console. All right, and uh, some of you saw us earlier this week at I.O., and so what we're going to be doing today is to give you even more of what we showed you, so you'll get to see more details on the new features we announced, as well as a couple more new things. So let's go back in the past for a second. Last year, Android Market, do you remember that? It was a recent memory, and Google Play was brand new. And all of you who publish apps on Google Play were using something that looked like this. This is the old developer console. I hope you've completely forgotten about it. But if you haven't, it looked a little bit like a web form from 1999. And so uh, Miles and I came on the stage at I.O. last year and said, guys, we've totally heard you. You know, your businesses are really taking off. And you need something that's really going to scale. Right? You need some professional tools to support all the great things that you're doing now. And we said, don't worry, we got your back. We've been working on something great. Um, it's the new developer console. So back in London, where we're all based, uh, we were excited to see your response. You started sending us thousands of pieces of feedback. It just all started pouring in. And many of you may be wondering, I sent in that feedback, and then what happened? Did anyone read it? Did it just go into a hole? And so I can actually tell you, rest assured, your feedback was read. And I know that because I actually read every single piece of feedback that you sent in via the feedback link at the top of the new developer console. And so I can tell you that actually we were delighted to see that the number one piece of feedback that came in was, hey guys, this new developer console, it's a lot better than the old one. And so we were relieved that at least we were going in the right direction. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We, uh, we were absolutely delighted to see that positive response. But also what started coming in was a bunch of feature requests. Hey, this is great, but. Could you also do? How about this? I also need that. You really should be doing more. And we said, absolutely. We totally agree with that. And so that's why we've been rolling out a ton of new features. So what we're going to do today for you here with some great demos is to show you how Google Play is evolving rapidly. We're rapidly moving to bring you tons of new features that are going to grow with your business and help you support Google's Play's enormous audience around the world. So let's walk through what we're going to do today. So again, we're going to be going into more detail in what you've already seen and also seeing new stuff. We're going to be going through three different areas. We have publishing your app your way on Google Play, how you can take control of publishing in our store, correct, connecting directly with customers. Secondly, we're going to be talking about optimizing your app, how we're giving you more data so that you can go deeper into how people are using your app and improve it. And then finally, how you can expand your app globally to take advantage of Google Play's global footprint and reach more audiences in new markets, expanding your business. So without any more ado, we're going to look at cool new stuff, and Miles Barr is going to take us through that. Thanks, Ali. I want to start today by talking about how Google Play keeps you in control of publishing your app. Our philosophy has always been to put no barriers between you and your users, meaning when you have a new version of your app ready, you can push it out to everyone at the same time. This can be very daunting, though, as anyone who's pushed a new app with a serious bug knows. So we figured we can do better. So I was happy to announce on Wednesday that we launched the beta testing and stage rollout feature in Google Play. This means you can start testing in your new version of the app with a small group of alpha testers. And when it's ready, move on to a larger group of beta testers. And once you're comfortable, your app is ready for prime time, you can roll it out in stages to the rest of your user base. This means you can keep your startup's new app under wraps. You can try out a major new UI with just your power users. Or you can even give a preview to the press. And why is this important? Because we want to ensure that your users are always happy with your app. So let's take a look at how this works. Here we are uh, in the developer console. As you can see, there are two new tabs, alpha testing and beta testing. These are essentially the same thing. They're two targeted groups that allows you to send a version of your app to a specific set of users. If a user can tar is in both tests, they'll receive the alpha one. At Google, our philosophy is to test our software early and often. So whenever a build is ready, 
we send it to our team so they can try it out. So let's switch to the alpha. So we'll do the same here. So first we've got a new APK, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna target our team, and we're gonna do this with a mailing, mailing list. So Ricardo's entering our team mailing list here. Now when you target a user for a beta test or an alpha test, they're not automatically opted in. For them to receive the version, they need to go to this link here and opt into the test. And this is available on the web and on the phone. And it explains to your users what being a tester is and they can opt in. And if at any point they want to opt out of the test, they can come back to the same page, opt out, and uninstall the test version of your app. Now beta tests and alpha tests are private. What this means is until a user opts in to your test, they'll see no details about the app on the Play Store. Similarly, we don't allow reviews of pre-release versions. So none of the details of your new app will leak. We recommend using a mailing list or a Google Plus community to talk to your testers. We do collect statistics and crash report data on your test versions so you can track the progress of how it's going. So let's say the alpha test has gone great. So we're gonna move it to beta. And this time, we want to have a wider set of testers. So instead of a mailing list, I'm gonna use a Google Plus community. This community is our, some of our most engaged users. They love our app, they love testing early versions and giving us feedback on the new features. So Ricardo is gonna just let the group know that we've got a new beta test ready and they can opt in. Now when setting up a beta test, it's important to get a good representation of your users. And by this I mean make sure that you've got a good mix of devices, people who speak different languages, and people on different carriers. You wanna ensure your app works for everyone once you publish it. Okay, so we've got a lot of feedback for our beta test. We fixed some bugs, and this last, latest version we're comfortable with, so we want to get it out to production. Now, I'm feeling pretty good about it because we've been through so many rounds of testing, but sometimes a bug does sn slip through. And what happens when, that, when you launch it? It means you get a lot of unhappy users and one-star reviews. So we're going to be on the safe side here, and we're going to do a stage rollout. So rather than choosing everyone, we're gonna start with about 10% of our users. At this point, users can now review your app. So you can see the feedback of how it's doing. And if there's a problem, you can stop the rollout, create a fix, and then we'll push that fixed version to that same original 10% of users. Shall okay. we roll it out to everybody? Hmm? Shall we go to everybody? Yeah, let's go to everyone. All right. And you can also use this feature to control traffic to your back ends. We know sometimes when you release a new version of your app, the traffic patterns differ. So by just looking at 10%, making sure your back end servers can handle the load, you can be sure once you push it to everyone, your app will work great. Okay, let's see how, hear about how someone's been using beta testing. Warpad's a great app that gives you access to over 10 million free books and short stories. They've been beta testing since the beginning, and they do this by having two separate apps in the Play Store, a beta version and their main live one. The beta version they push every single week, and the live one about once a month. Each feature they add to their app goes through three to four rounds of beta testing, so they get lots of feedback. Then they decide if it makes the cut and should go to the uh, monthly release. A great example of this is the new UI you see up here. They recently changed how users' books appear in their library. This is quite a big change. So they want to see how users would react to it. Unsurprisingly, they found that some users got it, some didn't. There was a bit of confusion. So before they launched it, they added a tutorial section explaining what the change was and how to find your books. This led to a seamless rollout to the rest of their users. Previously, well, they've been beta testing before we launched our feature. This meant that they had to create two listings and also manage their testers outside of Google Play. With the launch of today's feature, you can retain one store listing and also use Google tools like Google Groups and Google Plus communities to manage your testers. All right. Wattpad has a huge beta testing community, 25,000 users. But they've told us that they've seen benefits back when they only had 10 users. This gave them access to a wider range of devices than they had test, uh, testing in-house and also meant they got early feedback from real users. So if you ever get a one-star review again, <coughs> you know you haven't been beta testing. All right, now I want to talk to you about tablets. 
there are over 900 million Android devices activated now. And a growing part of that is tablets. On AndroidDeveloper.com, we now show you the proportions of devices by screen size and screen density. Tablets are the large and extra large screens. So you can get a good idea of how many tablets are out there. Also on developer.android.com, we've launched the tablet app quality checklist. This explains Google's criteria of what makes a good tablet app and gives you advice on how to optimize your app for tablets. If you haven't seen this already, please go to developer.android.com and check it out. Also, in the developer console, here in the optimization tips section, we automatically scan your app against the checklist to see how you're doing. If there's anything which your app doesn't meet, we explain it and tell you how to fix it. So it's important to follow these tips so you create a great tablet experience for your users. Also, once you've created a great new tablet UI, nice multi-pane using the Fragments API, you want to show it off. So last month in the Play Store, we gave you the ability to upload tablet screenshots so you can show how your app will look on a 7-inch and 10-inch tablet. When a user goes to the Play Store on a tablet, they'll see the tablet screenshots first. And on a phone, they'll see the phone ones. On Wednesday, we announced that the top list on tablets will be able to be filtered down so users will only see those apps designed specifically for tablets. <sighs> Thanks. Uh, so make sure that you follow all these guidelines so your app doesn't get left behind. So let's take a look at a great tablet app. I'm sure you've heard of Evernote. If you haven't, it's an app that lets you collect notes, record web pages, everything, and keeps you, uh, syncs across all your devices. Evernote has been creating a tablet app ever since we launched Honeycomb back in 2011. They've created a beautiful multi-pane UI and spent a lot of hard work on their tablet experience. It's all this hard work which has kept them a consistent editor's choice in Google Play. And it's not just a hit with us, it's also a hit with their users. As you can see here, their second most popular device is the Nexus 7, a tablet. Evernote's thought long and hard about what makes a good tablet experience. They found on a phone their users want to take, record a quick note or maybe pull up a piece of information. But on a tablet, they spend a lot more time organizing and planning and getting real work done. Here's what their VP of product had to say. By focusing on creating a great tablet experience, they created more engaged users, and these users have gone on to become paid subscribers of Evernote. All right, now I want to talk about a feature that's coming later this summer. A lot of you have sort of told us you want to give access to the console to more people within your company. In fact, if you were in the fireside chat yesterday, a lot of you asked for finer grain controls to the developer console. So later this summer, we'll be releasing several new permissions in the Play Store, allowing you to control exactly what each of your users can do. And these permissions can also be set on a per-application basis. So if you've ever wanted to give someone in your company access to your, to your stats, but make sure they don't mess around with your APKs, you'll soon be able to do that. So please stay tuned. Last year, here at I.O., we announced the pilot to our Reply to Reviews feature. <clears throat> This allowed you as a developer to reply directly to your users. I'm happy to say, after lots of rounds of testing and tweaking, we've now made this available to every single developer on Google Play. It gives you a direct channel to your users. So if you haven't started using this already, please read up on our policies and guidelines and start replying now. I'm gonna tell you about how one developer has been using this feature. Text Plus is an app that lets you chat with your friends all around the world through free SMSs and cheaper calls. Text Plus has gone all in on replying to reviews. Everyone in their team takes part in this, from the engineers, the product managers, and of course, their customer support team. Every day, twice a day, they look to see that they have any new reviews and reply directly to them. By doing this, they've really connected to their users and find out what their biggest pain points are. For each negative review, they try to turn around that user's experience by giving them advice and pointers to more help. If they succeed, those users typically change their review to a positive one. But they don't stop just there. For their positive reviews, the five-star reviews, they find these users are their most engaged users, their biggest advocates who tell other people about the app. They use a reply to review feature to speak directly to them to get their opinions on new features and what else they want to see in this app. 
By focusing on the user and having this attentive customer support, the newer versions of TextBus have a higher average rating in the store than the previous versions did. Here's what they had to say about it. They've used this direct line to their users to prioritize what features they could focus on, and now they have happier users and higher scores within the store. Now I'm going to hand over to Ricardo, our tech lead, to tell you more about data. Thanks, Miles. Hello, everybody. So Miles show you how you can have more control on the way you deploy your app to your users and how you present it to them. Now I want to shift your attention to data. I want to show you how the data in developer console helps you make informed decisions about your app and your business and helps you figure out what is the next most important thing to focus on. Over the course of the last year, we expanded the amount of data that we make available in developer console. I think you're all familiar with the standard metrics, installs and uninstalls, uh, per user, per device, divided across six different dimensions, country, SDK version, application version, language, and more. But in the past few months, we rolled out a few more metrics, and we announced a couple even a couple of days ago in the keynote. So let me focus on them for a second. One I want to talk about now is rating stats. Rating stats show you how the user star rating for your application changes over time. This is the metric you want to look at when you want to see whether the new version of your application that you just rolled out is getting the same good user reviews, good user satisfaction compared to the previous version. We offer this in two variants. So you have the cumulative rating. This is the overall aggregated rating over the lifetime of, the entire, of your application. This is good for the long-term view, when you want to review what you did historically in the past and the decision that you made at the time. Another one that we offer is the daily average rating. This is the you know, aggregated over all daily ratings over the lifetime of your app. And this is good for the short-term view when you want to spot problems early on. I want to mention a couple of cases where this is particularly useful. One is reply to reviews. So you can use this metric to identify segments of your user base where customer satisfaction is not as good as you would expect. And from that, you can then jump to reply to reviews that we, as Miles just described, and provide dedicated customer support exactly to those users. On the other side, it works the other way around as well. If you're spending a lot of time doing customer support and offering replies to your users, then you may want to use this metric to verify the effectiveness of what you've done and see that you are actually achieving the results that you were expecting. Another feature in which this is particularly useful is stage rollouts. Unlike alpha and beta, where users cannot leave reviews or ratings, during a stage rollout, users will be able to rate and review your app. And that means that you know, when you are at 5% of a stage rollout, you have your brand new application out there, you're on the edge of your chair, you want to make sure that everything is fine, um, you may want to use this metric to see whether everything is doing well as you expect. In this example, we rolled out a new version of our application in mid-April, the orange line, but it never really called up with the baseline, which is the green line. And so this is maybe the point where you want to pause your stage rollout and decide what to do. Like all the other metrics that we have, if the breakdown by the top 10 values, like the top 10 countries or et cetera, is not enough, obviously you can always export as a CSV and you get the full data payload so you can integrate it with your tools. Another thing that you want to talk about is filtering crash reports, because we now allow you to filter crash reports by application version since a few weeks. Again, now that we have beta testing and stage rollouts, this is extremely useful because it means that you can look at the crash reports that are coming only from your alpha version. Maybe you know, it's a little bit more crashy. Um, and then decide what to do. During a stage rollout as well, we keep collecting crash reports. And so you can see and decide what to do for your stage rollout, whether to pause it or continue it, based on the amount of crashes that you're getting. So now everything is fine. You know, Users are happy, you're not getting any crashes, unicorns and rainbows all over the place. It's, the time. it's time to talk about money. I want to talk about a new page that we launched on Wednesday, which is revenue charts. I always find it a bit annoying that you know, just to figure out how much money you made yesterday, you had to go to the developer console, download the CSV report, put it in a graphing or spreadsheet program, aggregate everything just to see how much money you made yesterday. And I think that was just nonsense. And so we decided to fix it. And starting Wednesday, you have this new page which show you how the revenue for your app change over time. Aggregated daily, uh, you, uh, you can divide it or inspect it by country and by source of revenue, say by applications, revenue generated from application sales, in-app products, or subscriptions. I think this is great to get an overview of how your application <coughs> is doing at a glance. You can come here every day, look at how much money you made yesterday. And it lets you also do some sort of analysis. You can you know, 
look at whether you are ahead of your company targets or not, and whether some countries are performing as well as you would expect. But I also know that many of you want to integrate this data with your own custom financial reporting tools and data pipelines. So another thing that we're doing in the coming few weeks is that all of financial reporting from the Google Play Developer Console will be available in Google Cloud Storage. And what that means is that by using the utilities provided by Google Cloud Storage, like GSU2, you will be able to have programmatic access to your financial reports and to your financial data so you can integrate it with your own data pipelines. The other benefit of this is that by the, thanks to the new permission model, granular permissions that Miles just described, you will be able to set up a dedicated account that will only have access to financial data and will all be used for accessing those financial data in cloud storage, and that account will not be able to mess up with your APK configuration or something, so you can separate roles there. Okay, let's talk about referral tracking and usage. So another thing I would like all of you to have is one place, one single place, where you can see all the data that pertains and is about your application. And I know that many of you are using Google Analytics to track user engagement and user interaction with your application. But so far, the experience was fragmented. You had to go to the developer console to see device and install metrics. You had to go to Google Analytics to see activity and user engagement. And soon, so in the coming few weeks, you will be able to link together Google Analytics and Google Play Developer Console. And what that means is that once linked together, in the Google Play Developer Console, sorry, in Google Analytics, you will have access to additional new metrics. In particular, you will be able to see how many views, downloads, and installs your marketing campaigns triggered on Google Play. And this is really good because it gives you a better view of the conversion funnel. You can see better, more details about how your users discover your app and then went to install your app and then became daily active users. This integration goes both ways. And so you will, have, you will have access to engagement metrics directly from the Play Developer Console. So next to installs and other metrics, you will also see engagement like number of active users. Okay, so a few more things about optimization tips. So Miles spent a few minutes talking about how you can use the optimization tips section to learn whether your app is well designed for tablets, whether it meets the quality checklist requirements, and et cetera. But I have bigger plans for the optimization tip section. I want that to become the place where you go to discover personalized recommendations and insights that are specific to your app and your context. So starting from a few days ago, from Wednesday, you now have additional tips present in that section, what we call them localization tips. They help you how to reach a bloated audience and how to expand your app to multiple countries. When you decide it's time to go global, you, know, you have to do a number of things. You have to localize your APK, you have to then localize your store listings, you may even want to consider localizing your screenshots because for some markets that's really important. And most importantly, you have to decide which countries to focus on first, where should I go first? So now in the optimization tip sections, you will get these localization insights that will guide you in the process. They will tell you whether you're missing anything, Maybe you localize your APK, but you forgot to localize your listing. And we'll also help you identify opportunities. They, for example, will tell you, you know, you may have a lot of free users from Russia, even though you never localize your app there. That's a great opportunity that you should go into. Which brings me to the next topic, which is reaching play global audience. So when you decide to go, oops, too bad. When you decide to go global, the first and most important thing that you want to do is localize your application contents. And many developers are already doing that and expanding into new markets. And as a non-native English speaker, as you may have, you may have guessed from my funny accent, uh, I'm Italian, I think one of the most important things is to make sure that your app is available to as many users and as many countries and as many languages as possible, but still providing the same high quality experience that you would provide to users that speak your own language. And we announced it on Wednesday, that now, from the Google Play Developer Console, you have access to professional translations in collaboration with the Google Translation Manager team. And let me show you how this works. So, in the APK screen, at the very bottom, there will be a, there is a new section, which is called the App Translation Service, that you can use to start and request a professional translation. <coughs> Just click the button, starts a wizard that will guide you through the process, you pick a project name, uh, that is just for your convenience. You may have multiple projects going on at any same time. 
pick the version, the, sorry, the language you're translating from. You then upload the strings. Uh, if you're using the Android developer tools, you can use that directly from the Eclipse plugin. Otherwise, you can just upload the XML files. Once that's done, you wait, then you go. You pick the languages you want to translate into. Uh, I'm gonna pick, I don't know, Japanese and Korean. There's just two markets that you cannot be outside of. You pick the service level. The service level basically decides how many users, how many people are actually looking at your strings and contributing to the translation in the translation company you pick. You get an idea of the price. You choose the translation company you want to use. You get an indication of how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. Obviously, the cost of the translation depends on how many words you have in your strings file. And then you get a confirmation page where you can review your order and get started with your translation. The moment you confirm that, the translation company will start right away translating your strings. And from the developer console, you will be able to check progress. You will be able to see how far ahead the translation company is in translating all your content. While they're doing their work, you will be able to communicate with them, answer any questions that might arise, troubleshooting, these kind of things. And then once all the strings are done, you will be able to, again from the developer console, download them, put them into your APK, pack everything, and publish. And this feature is rolling out in private beta, just like we did for the developer console itself last year, which means that if you go to the APK page right now, you will see a sign-up form where you can see, where you can leave our, uh, your contact details, and then we'll shortly start rolling these out to everybody. I want to reinforce again the importance of reaching global audience. I want to speak for a few seconds about Gameloft. So I think all of you know who Gameloft is. They are a very successful game com games company. They are based in Europe. Uh, they realized very early the importance of targeting multiple languages in multiple locales. They're currently available to 12 languages, um, English, German, Italian, French, Chinese, Japanese, and a few other European and Asian languages. And they have two experiences they want to share with you. One is when they decided to localize Ice Age Village to Russian. So Ice Age Village has a user base of 10 million users, and they discovered that 14% of those users are actually Russian users. That's the second biggest market after English users. Another case that they had is when they decided to localize My Little Pony to Turkish. As part of a global application update, they had the Turkish localization and they discovered very interesting figures. So the number of active users in Turkey jumped up by 95% compared to 20 to 25% that did in other countries. And that was thanks to the presence of localized content rather than just a simple application update. The revenue jumped up by 600% in Turkey, and the revenue per daily active users jumped up by 300%. And another tip that you might want to use that they took advantage of, um, they used local holidays and other local knowledge to make promotions and sales, like they did, for example, for the Chinese New Year. So yeah, so let me stress it one more time. Think global. Always claim to target a really global audience in multiple countries and multiple languages. I hope that this feature that we just announced will help you do that easily. And if you want to learn more, there's a session at noon, I think, which is building Android apps for a global audience, where you can learn more how all this translation process works and the details behind that. Having said that, let me go back to Ellen. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ricardo. All right, so today we've given you uh, an overview of everything that we're bringing you to try to help you grow your businesses across these three different areas. First, publishing your app, having more control over it, connecting directly with your user base. Secondly, gaining insight into your users and what they're doing with your app, and then expanding your app to grow your user base into new markets. So, because there was a lot of stuff, we're gonna give you a quick summary of everything that's new. So, first of all, we have, of course, beta testing and stage rollouts, which allows you to get user feedback early on in the process and respond to it. Secondly, we're giving you summaries and overviews of user ratings and your revenue so that you can check those stats at your fingertips very easily. Uh, next, we're giving you tablet-specific screenshots so you can show off your awesome tablet layouts. And if your app isn't designed for tablets yet, we give you optimization tips to help you make it that way. We're also helping you identify how to localize your app and where you should go first with new localization tips. We also announced that everyone can now reply to reviews. 
But stay tuned because there's a lot more coming this summer. So we have three new areas that, where you should uh, watch for some announcements on the Android developers blog in the future. First of all, we're going to be having those extra access controls. So you can grant more people uh, access to the developer console without getting worried. Um, we're also adding new Google Analytics integration figures. So these were the campaign referral tracking flows, that conversion funnel, and also seeing your Google Analytics usage data directly in the developer console. And finally, if you're interested in translating your app with our new app translation service, which is being offered in partnership with our internationalization team, uh, sign up today in the developer console. It's at the bottom of the APK page if you're looking for it. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, everything that we're doing is with you, Google Play developers, in mind. And we need to keep getting your feedback in order to plan our next 12 months and even farther in the future. So we hope that you'll join us for office hours today following this session. Um, we hope that you also rush right back after that because at 12 o'clock there's a very important session on monetization and everyone's looking for more information about money. So um, if you're watching this session online and you miss the office hours, you want to make sure that you're following Android developers on Google Plus because that's the best place to go to see new announcements about what's happening in the world of Android development. You can watch Hangouts. We always post our blog posts there as well and we go and look for your feedback about what you're looking to see on Google Play. So that's it. And the next thing we're going to do now is start by taking some questions. We have about eight minutes left. So if you'd like to come to the microphone at the front, or I think there may be possibly one there as well, that would be great. We'll alternate between the two microphones. All right, so you in the red hat at the front, what would you like to ask? Hi, Chuck Greb from AWeber Communications. Um, I actually have two really quick questions. I had a lot more, but I narrowed it down to two. Um, so with the new uh, alpha beta production, um, mm. Uh, system for launching a new version, is there still a concept of draft APKs? And if so, how does that relate to testing in-app billing? Mm, great question. Do you want to take this one? Or? No, please. Okay. No. Yes. All right, um, I'm going to take this one. So when you go into the advanced mode part of the tab, you can upload draft APKs. Um, so that's sort of se still separate from alpha and beta testing. You can imagine the alpha and beta tabs is exactly the same um, as production. So I think, and the drafts are shared across all three sections. Correct? Is that right? Yep. Okay. So, good. Yeah. So they, they will have access to uh, in-app billing for testing purposes. So specific okay. for in-app billing, um, I, think, I think we still have a few improvements to do. But you know from the in-app billing sandbox that was announced in these days, you can both use the tester section in the developer profile to decide testers that will have, for example, access to the full in-app billing experience without having to actually pay, or you can use beta testing and then sideloading that APK, for example, or um, to do fake purchases. OK, thank you. Um, and then my other question was about the uh, staged rollouts for the um, actual listing. If you want to add some new screenshots, new description, things like that, if you're doing a staged rollout, is only the people who are getting the update going to see the new listing, or is everyone going to see it? No. At the moment, there's just still one listing. Yeah. So you may want to be, uh, you want to pay attention to that for the moment, for the time being. So if you put something in your store listing, for example, a brand new feature, and you're still rolled out only to 5% of the users, you know, it may be, you have to communicate that probably. Maybe you want to say that we are rolling out a new version, and that's the feature that you're getting, and they will be getting over the, first, the next few days. So you say for the time being, that makes me hopeful about what's to come. <laughs> yes. Thanks. We're always looking for feedback. All right, uh, in the back, please. Hi, my name is Manfred Moser. Um, I have an interest in uh, automating the whole process of the deployment, now with staging and deployment. Um, is there some sort of like plan towards being allowed to like integrate on a continuous integration server to automatically, as part of, say, a nightly build with QA tests that are automated, push it out to a staged environment automatically? I mean, at the moment, I'm doing with Selenium, but that's right. a hack, right? So. Yeah. Is there some sort of plan to like have an API maybe so that it could even be integrated in build tools? <laughs> yeah, all right. We've yeah. totally heard you. This has been a super popular developer request, right? Everyone's got their own system, and we're really excited with the beta testing that more and more people want to be pushing their APKs even more often. So I guess, you know, we won't say too much about the future, but we definitely will say that we, we've heard that, we're thinking about it, and, you know, as soon as we have anything to share, uh, we'll definitely let you know, but we definitely hear you on that one. That's a very common request that we get. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in the Play Store, you guys added the uh, Design for Tablets uh, feature because mm -hmm. you recognize that phones and tablets are fundamentally different in their apps. Yeah. Um, with more smart glass products coming out, is that going to be extensible to other types of products? 
And if one were to manufacture such a product, how would they engage with you guys to make sure that that feature would happen and uh, set the criteria and all that kind of stuff? All right. All right. Take this one. Uh, it, it's a good one. So right now we're only sort of focusing on tablets, but we're aware, you know, within our own team, we've got sort of, well, our team and externally, lots of different form factors sort of coming out. So, um, you know, when you think of things like Google TV, um, it's something we consider. I think we want to wait for a particular device class to sort of take off or begin to get a foothold before we, ha before we change the store. Uh, but definitely, you know, other form factors is something we would consider. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, I, I have a question about um, the device distribution of my app in the Play Store um, dashboard. So what I see is like the top 10 devices where my app is doing good, but what are the top 10 devices on an aggregate level in Play Store that I don't know and I might be the case that uh, the top app device in my app might be the fifth in the global stack ranking and I might be leaving a lot of money on the table because uh, my app really don't do well on the top devices in the global ranking. Is there any way I can get access to that data? Uh, so short answer, no. Um, but. Uh, the aim is that like, you shouldn't be focusing on particular types of devices. You should be making sure your app works across all devices, you know, in the same great experience. Mm -hmm. um, so don't, yeah, don't worry too much about um, specific devices. Um, try, you know, like use a beta testing feature, try to reach more users on different devices to make sure it works well. You know, if you're doing some really sort of cutting edge stuff, we've seen some people, you know, really push the boundaries of 3D and, and that sometimes that causes problems. Um, you know, you can look at the, the crash report section in particular to find out if, if there's a problem device and how best to fix on it. Um, but definitely don't try to optimize your app for a specific set of devices. Just, you know, make sure it's a great experience for everyone. Thank you. Uh, John Coriat with uh, Radar Now, US Navaguide. Um, I have some APKs in my developer console that are years old and essentially abandoned. And now with the, uh, the rollout of the beta feature, mm -hmm. I'm going to have all these beta versions of our apps stuck out there. Is there going to be a feature to archive or delete, you know, old and abandoned APKs? Yeah, this is also a very popular request. Saw some applause over there. Um, so it depends. So right now, many of you may not know this, but if you have not published an app, you can delete it today. Yeah, so if you go to the developer console on the right-hand side, there's a little, I don't know, gray button, and you can select delete. Um, well, these are like apps. I know. That, you if you've know. published them, I totally hear you on that. I see a lot of feedback. It's definitely in the top 10 things that we're seeing coming in with the feedback, so we hear you on that. Um, I guess with the alpha and beta, just to be really clear, those are in the same store listing, so it's not going to litter up your app page anymore. But we definitely hear folks are, who are having apps that they don't work on anymore, and they kind of want to hide that, so... Uh, we're definitely well, looking like into that possibility. Well, I have beta versions of our oh, apps for testing, and now okay. we're going to With different package those. names. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah, we've definitely heard that. I guess we're not announcing any changes today that are happening there, but we've definitely heard that as a top 10 request. Well, thank you very much. Is that, is that just something that you would like to hide from the applications list? Yeah, it would be okay if we could just archive them so that they're not mm -hmm. sticking there right in our face every time yeah. we go in. You know, I mean, sometimes also be good to order, be able to order the list so that the ones that we're using and that are popular at the top instead mm -hmm. of, I don't know exactly, and you might have it alphabetically now yeah. or something. Yeah. Thanks, alphabet, yeah. 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 Okay. But archiving, just archive, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. hide or something. Yeah, yeah a good. lot of folks Got have it. wanted to hide the unpublished ones, like once they're not using it anymore to hide them. So we definitely have heard that one. Great. Thanks very much. Oh, I love the comments thing, by the way. I've had oh, it for yeah? a year. It's great. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. I'm glad. The back. Hi, my question is about staged rollouts, and specifically, how do you determine which percentage of users is it, and is it the same percentage of users each time, or is it different? So when you release new, new versions of the app, is it always going to be that same 10% that you're going to be? Selling? So, yeah, so it's random per stage rollout. Okay. Um, so by that, so when, you, when you're rolling out a new version, uh, we sort of have a, a different random seed to, to select which 10%. Um, but we keep that seed during that rollout process. So if you don't want to, you know, push that out to 100%, you want to replace it with another APK, those original 10% will get the update. So you could have then two, like you could have a 2.0 to everyone, a 2.1 to 10%, and then a 2.2 to a different 10%? Is that possible? No, no, no there's no. only one stage rollout at okay. any time. So anytime you do a stage rollout, we pick a different part of the population. So, you know, it's not the same guys that get the same testing APK each time. Uh, but during a stage rollout, if you decide that the particular APK needs changing, then you can change it, and the same group of users will receive that. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And also to clarify, stage rollout's not for testing. Yeah, sorry. Um, right. Only stage rollout when you're ready for everyone to get it. All right, so it looks like we basically have five seconds left, but don't worry, I still see some folks wanting to ask questions. We're just going to head back to office hours, and don't forget that there's a monetization section in here in, uh, in an hour. Or in Thanks. at 11.